So welcome back to Paris Lesbos, the most fabulous podcast in the world. And today our subject is the woman known primarily as Oscar Wilde's niece and Natalie Barney's lover. And in my opinion, had a really harsh life. Oh no, another one of those. Yes, your catchphrase will be in much use this episode, Pixie. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So who is it? It's Dolly Wilde. Oh, I've been waiting for this. You just you hear her name popping up, you know, here and there. Dolly Wilde? Who is that? What? Another gay? This entire podcast is very gay. Fair enough. So so where do we where do we set our scene? Where do we begin? We begin in England in eighteen ninety five. Oscar Wilde has been in prison for three months. And in that auspicious time. <laughs> yes, the Wilde family is in turmoil over his imprisonment and the whole scandal of his homosexuality or bisexuality. But in the meantime, his younger brother, Willie, has a daughter, Dolly. Dolly is born in the midst of all this turmoil. Wonderful. Great start. A very inauspicious start, and it continues from there. She gets moved around a lot, occasionally living with her parents for the first few years, but only occasionally. She's usually off living with other people. How come? Her parents own troubles. She is returned to her parents, though, when she is three. Is that a good thing for her? Are they good parents to her? Yes and no. You see, her father dies in 1900 of liver failure, alcohol-related, when she is five. Gotcha. So, poor woman, already. Yes, and she also doesn't seem to be very close to her mother. She doesn't seem close to any parental figure at all throughout her childhood and adolescence Mm. and into adulthood. Did she have friends? Not much is known about her past. She didn't speak of it much. Wow, so probably not great. And No, not great. Her biographer mentions a theory that abuse of some kind might have been involved. She draws parallels to cases where child abuse did occur and where the victims don't talk about their past, they tend to avoid it. Mm. As a plausible explanation, but really more of a theory right. than anything we else. Don't really know. If that makes sense. Yeah, what we do know is that her mother does remarry and she does briefly have a younger half brother, but he dies early on. So oh, she's man. Yeah, so she's basically an only child. This kid cannot catch a break. She can't. She can't even catch a break when she runs away because she decides to go to France in 1914 when oh, World War One has broken out. Wow, wow! You think? I mean, because we just we just did running away to France, and it changes your life. Um, and here we have running away to France, and there's a war there. Well, it does change her life. Mm-hmm. See, she runs away with the express purpose of joining the war. Oh. How would she do that? By becoming an ambulance driver. Hmm. Right, this was like a phenomenon for young women to do. Could you explain a bit about what that was like? So during World War I, women, especially upper-class women, aristocratic women, would actually pay a lot of the time for the privilege of driving an ambulance in France. Now, why would they do such a thing? Doing their bit for king and country, all of the rhetoric going around. Gotcha. So there's was how a, they showed their patriotism. Yes, there's a good novel about this phenomenon, Not So Quiet, which details all of that. There were several various units. You could drive with the French. You could join uh, VAD which also took nurses. And then there were the Scottish women's hospitals, which usually were more on the Eastern Front in Greece and so forth. Gotcha. So was this like a like a touristy thing for her? Or was, you know, because it sounds like there's like you're choosing between different groups to be part of, you know, and you're your upper class lady of refinement. This, this does kind of sound like tourism a bit. To some it would be. For Dolly, I think it was just the adventure. Mm. And the gang away from her mother. 
So is that a good time for her? Did she get something out of it? Well, she initially lives with four other ambulance drivers in Montparnasse. Mm -hmm. And one of them is Marion Bear, known as Joe Carstars, the standard oil heiress, mm -hmm. who she has an affair with. Nice. So the war does bring some good things. She ends it as a lieutenant with some kind of medal. It's been suggested it was probably the Croix de Guerre. What was that? It was a French medal. Translation would be War Cross or Cross of War. Mm. But what did it, like, mean? Well, it was given for various reasons. Not necessarily heroism in the way you would think a lot of things. It wasn't, like, the Medal of Honor equivalent or anything like that. But it was a fairly more common medal that wasn't sort of a participation medal, like the Victory Medal or the British War Medal. You had to actually have done something to earn it. Gotcha. So it's it's neither the best type of medal nor the worst type of medal to receive. No. It's more, if I had to draw a comparison, I would draw it to the present-day Bronze Star. So she is a decorated war hero. Um. <laughs> yes, an officer. Right. What does she do now? I mean, how does she translate this to post-war life? Well, she travels quite a lot, but the war doesn't... She doesn't leave everything behind like many people. She takes things from it. In fact, she got hooked on morphine. Oh, yeah, that's a nice souvenir from the war. So Dolly is traveling around. She's hopping from hotel to hotel, from friend's house to friend's house, couch surfing, as we would call it today. Mm -hmm. Is that because she needs to, or just as a kind of bohemian thing to do? Sort of as a dolly thing to do. She never really settled in one place. She was always moving. Mm -hmm. So she'd travel back and forth between France and England, Paris and London, going to parties. At one point, she takes a trip to Algiers in 1924. It's said with friends that she tried to write her letters, at least, of the Algiers trip in the style of Russian literature, sort of trying to become a writer. Wow. All right. Dolly Wilde is not a writer, actually. Mm -hmm. But during this time, her mother dies in 1922, giving her a small inheritance. Mm. Which she puts to good use, I hope? Yes and no. Mm -hmm. She is already hooked on morphine and partying quite a lot. Oh. During this time, she also has an affair with Alla Nazimova, the Hollywood actress in either 1925 or 1926. Now, her affair is like intentionally just like for funsies i mean I'm, I'm not getting a sense of like partnership happening here you know i wouldn't say partnership at all more for funsies as you put it mm -hmm. so yeah. short affairs one night stands right is is she angling toward partnership or is that just not how she rolls this isn't how she rolls right now mm-hmm she also briefly appears in her friend Honey Harris's film Treasure's Bargain in Ooh. three different minor roles. Huh. Is, did she want to be an actress or was this just another one of her things that she did? I think it's her sort of bouncing around from the way she also bounced around from place to place was from project to project almost. I get the sense that Dolly didn't quite know what to do with herself. Mm. Mm -hmm. It probably didn't help that people were constantly comparing her to her uncle. Yeah, I'm sure. How did she feel about that? Did she know him? Because he had been imprisoned, like, in her childhood, right? She didn't really know him. She knew a lot about him because she was around people who had known him. So, for instance, her friend Honey Harris's family had known Oscar Wilde and... It was the same circles that she was floating through that he had. Gotcha. So she knew him more by reputation. Yes. She even would, on occasion, dress up as him for fun. <laughs> nice. Because apparently they looked quite alike. Many people thought it was Oscar Wilde in resurrected feminine form. Love it. I have seen pictures of her. She did look very much like him. And that would be of no use to her, no help, in mm -hmm. my opinion. 
But in the meantime, she's continuing to hop from friend's house to friend's house and partying and taking drugs. Mm-hmm. It, it has been speculated also that Honey Harris and Dolly were lovers, but many people also see that as very unlikely and that they were actually just close friends Despite mm-hmm. how they would talk to each other in letters, it's thought that Harris would never have had an affair. Yeah, that is always tough when you're looking at historical figures because we weren't there. Um, and, you know, and plus they had different understandings of uh, what was a normal thing to do or say with a friend uh, and what, you know, according to gender roles, a relationship should be. So. Yes, and then you're also contending with a whole lot of dead people sharing their opinions on things. Right. And some of them trying to spread, like, malicious gossip also. Yes, as we will see in the next episode. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you're like, are are they really gay for each other? Or do people just like to spread the rumor that they're gay for each other because they want to slander them? Or do they just hope because they think it would be good for the both of them? Right. That too. Either way. Dolly pops up at Natalie's salon in 1927, and naturally she ends up in Natalie's bed. I mean, because of course. Who wouldn't? Through this circle, she actually ends up doing translation work for Nancy Cunard, Natalie, and Lily de Gremmel. Hmm. What sort of translation work? Translating their works for yeah, them. To what, and though? Language to language. But which one's the- French and English. Obviously, considering the circle we're in. No, I just felt like a lot of these people knew French already. I mean, they're all living in Paris. Like, what are they doing? Have no time to translate their own works. I guess. That is wild. Because I, in my mind, they were always just like, you know, writing their English version and their French version. Just like, going oh, no. about it. No. No. For instance, Natalie wrote almost exclusively in French. There's only one English novel she wrote, which is an incredibly weird one that even she looked at afterwards and it felt it was like she had written it in a fever dream. <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's so weird. So she just like had all these French and she was like spoke English natively, but she's just like, nope, it's all going to be in French. Yeah. Uh, If you see a work of Natalie's in English that isn't A.D.'s Afterlife, it has been translated from French. Wild. Oh, yeah. So I guess that is important to have your translator friend. Was that something that she enjoyed doing or was it just like something to occupy her time? I think it was something to occupy her time and give her money and was an outlet for some sort of writing ability. Mm -hmm. Everyone does note that Dolly was incredibly witty. Her letters were incredibly enjoyable. Everyone actually thought she should be a writer. Except for Janet Flanner and Lily de Grimmel. Ooh. Was there drama there? Not in the way you're thinking. Janet Flanner, for instance, saw Dolly as more like a literary character in how she lived and was than as a writer. Hmm. Was she a muse for anyone? In some ways. Not in the ways that we've seen, though. Mm-hmm. For instance, she does show up as Doll Furious in Juna Barnes' Lady's Almanac. Mm. So she makes appearances. She does. But she's not, like, the muse of X person or whatever. That's not... That doesn't become her role. No. This sort of loops back to the whole Oscar Wilde, Dolly Wilde comparison. In my opinion, it feels a lot like she and everyone else was sort of trying to fit a round peg in a square hole. Mm. Like wanting her to much more be like her uncle when she wasn't. Mm. In what ways? The trying to become a writer and yet not really seeming to work for her. Like it didn't come naturally. A lot of the time to me it just feels... Like, Dolly was bouncing from place to place and thing to thing, trying to figure out what to do with herself and what to do with her life. Mm. Mm. So it's kind of hard to get out of her uncle's shadow. Yes, and in the meantime, her drug habit continues. 
Mm -hmm. Oh no, is it having effects on her life now? It will in coming years, but at times even Natalie's housekeeper would uh, notice Dolly shooting up with needles in the thigh at dinner at Rue Jacob when she thought no one was looking. That's not great. No, it's not, and it didn't help that she was partying with the Fitzgeralds and the Cocteau set, driving fast cars, never her own. Hmm, that sounds like a recipe for disaster. But disaster doesn't come yet. Instead, she possibly has an affair with Janet Flanner, the New Yorker correspondent in Paris. Who doesn't think she can become a writer? No. (laughs) No, she doesn't. And there is the domestic disputes that come with being Natalie's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. She does mostly get on with Romaine Brooks, one of the two main loves of Natalie Barney's life. Mm -hmm. However, there is the mistress taking over your bedroom at your wife's incident. Right, yes, which we discussed, which was not maybe necessarily a thing of, of deep hatred, but was maybe just a momentary setback. An annoyance, because when Dolly Wilde has taken your preferred bedroom at your wife's and you're coming back to town, obviously Dolly should be kicked out of it so that you can stay there, Mm -hmm. is how Romaine sees it. Yeah. Right. So, how does Dolly feel about this? Do we know? She actually likes Romaine. She might Mm -hmm. have even had a crush on her. Oh, Uh, She also envies Romaine's ability to basically wall herself off and run away from people when she felt like it. Because Dolly on occasion would actually hole up in a hotel room or some bedroom and not let anyone through the door. But she felt like she didn't quite have that, like, level of boundary setting. No. She seemed to go from partying constantly surrounded by people in one instant to leave me alone (laughs) in another. She also sort of complained along with Romaine to Natalie about Nadine Wong. Natalie's Mm. chauffeur, sort of secretary, and lover at a different point. Mm -hmm. It did not help that Nadine claimed Dolly took a sapphire ring of Natalie's and sold it to pay for drugs. Did she? Possibly. What we do know is that Nadine rifled through her purse, found drugs, and a letter or some note saying something about 150 pounds of opium. All right. That is a lot. Yes, and she wrote to Natalie about this. Natalie then kicked Dolly out of her house by a letter over that. Mm-hmm. I can imagine. That must be really rough, though, um, for Dolly, as she has her opium habit and now her alcohol habit. And she's getting kicked out of her girlfriend's place. I can see why Natalie wouldn't want to enable that. But that sounds like a real low point. It does. Natalie does help pay for her detox treatments alongside other people. Mm -hmm. But as uh, Dolly's biographer noted, Natalie is not the most stable of people for Dolly trying to dry out because turbulent circumstances in the life of Natalie Barney. Right. Natalie does have a lot of drama. With with a lot of girlfriends come a lot of drama. And her two wives, and her wives saying, no, you can't have another wife. Yeah. So, so how is Dolly through all of this? Is, is the detox treatment helping? She's in and out of what are termed nursing homes, doing different detox treatments. Do we know what those treatments are like? Not really. We get a lot more about different treatments of her later on during World War II before she dies. Because mm-hmm. she does struggle with drug withdrawal and other things throughout her life till the end. I can imagine. I mean, I've, I've read stuff about heroin addiction. Um, and that's like a physical withdrawal as well as a mental one. Yes. So this is going on throughout the 30s. Dolly does get to go back to Natalie's house. Because we have uh, the incident where in 1939, before either of them left Paris, she actually slept through the air raids. Nice. Now, is this because of all of the, I guess, 
morphine, opium, whatever? Or um, is that just because she's a really good sleeper? Though Dolly was known to take sleep-inducing drugs, there's also the fact that this woman loved a good bed. Mm. All right, she wrote letters there. She did. Con- she conducted other business while lounging in them. Dolly was not going to get up out of bed just because an air raid siren has gone off. God, same though. <laughs> I love her. She's so relatable. But anyway, since Natalie leaves Paris during World War II for Florence, as we covered in her episode, Dolly is sent off to London. Is sent? Yes, Natalie puts her on a train. Oh. And where does she stay? Who does she stay with? She stays in a hotel. Mm, alone? Yes. She does start volunteer work for the Polish Relief Fund. Mm. But uh, all is not well because in 1940 she's diagnosed with breast cancer. On top of everything else. And she refuses to undergo surgery. Why? She doesn't want to be cut open. Mm. Is this like a religious thing or just like she values her like bodily integrity or something? More so bodily integrity, which is ironic because she actually goes to the coroners after she is dead and is then cut open to see what killed her. Mm. So back to the the present, I guess. Um, But is she... Does does the disease affect her for a long time, or? So she does undergo treatments for the next year, but uh, she's also going through drug withdrawal and other things. It's actually thought with her biographer that she had early menopause, which no one realized because the signs were hidden by drug withdrawal. Oh, wow. So she just had a lot of medical stuff going on that people didn't know about. Correct. Uh, The insomnia would have been hidden, it's thought, by drug withdrawal, the just feeling like shit in general. Mm -hmm. How old was she at the time? She was 44 in 1940. Wow. That's just rough. She is 44. Yeah, poor woman. And then there's the mystery of her death. Mm -hmm. Right, so you said that they had to cut her open because they couldn't figure out why she died? So she's found one morning in this hotel room, half in and half out of bed, in what is described as a violent death. Oh, no. Like, there's no obvious sign of, like, her being bludgeoned over the head or anything. Actually, many people believe her death was a suicide or an accidental overdose. Mm -hmm. Which... Sort of makes sense. You can see why they thought that, because she had tried to commit suicide, actually, twice before in 1931 and 1934. Both Mm. times she was never fully lucid. And there is a photo where there's scars on her right wrist that might be evident Mm. of those attempts. Not everyone was convinced. Some people thought she had been murdered. Mm. Her biographer puts forth the idea that someone had come in and been shooting heroin with her, and if she had taken a sleeping drug earlier to help her sleep, that it mixed with the bit of sleeping drug still in her system and led to her convulsing and having an overdose and dying, Mm. and that the person fled because they were drug out themselves, but who really knows? Right. That would make sense. Also, that's an awful way to go, though. That sounds terrible. Yes. Uh. We'll never fully know, though. Much of Dolly's life is unknown, so we'll never know if anyone was with her, some hidden girlfriend or druggy friend. Who knows? Mm-hmm. Now, had she been using, like, up until this point? Pretty much. Dolly liked to get her drugs from doctors, and that was becoming a lot harder. Mm. Wow, that is really sad, though, to think that she went through all that with the withdrawals and then just went back. That seemed to be the case. She would go back and forth 
she would be going through withdrawal and then she gets her hand on, on some drugs and it would be continuing cycle. Mm -hmm. Poor woman. That just, that's so rough. Yes. And keeping with our theme of lesbians and religion, she was a Catholic at the end. Uh Uh-huh. Did she like convert shortly before she died or something? A couple of years before. Mm Mm-hmm. Do we know any reason for it? Not really, no. A lot of Dolly's life and reasoning isn't known all that well. Mm. So, but is it likely that it's, as with other Catholic lesbians, that when she did die, she wanted to be with people that she loved? Perhaps. Do we have any other sense of, like, like, did she do religious things? Did she, I don't know. Was there other religion in her life except for the conversion? Didn't find any evidence of it. So just a mysterious woman. Who knows? Yes, a very mysterious woman. Her will was actually left in Natalie's bank box. Mm -hmm. Which is rather fitting because she left everything to Natalie. Oh. The required that she give some money to her friend Honey Harris. Who designed the grave marker for Dolly who shared a grave with her mother. Oh, that's sweet. So at least she was reconciled with her mother at the end, <laughs> in a mm-hmm. way. As for what we have left, we have her letters. Many of those survive. Though uh, there is no published book of them that I could find. Do we have any good quotes from them? I don't know about good quotes, but when I opened the book... The first quote of hers that popped up was, No, dearest Natnat, I have neither seduced the pretty piano-playing child nor tightened my encircling arms around honey into a morris a manner. I am as chaste as Diana and hot on the pursuit of my blonde love. (laughs) Wow, okay. (laughs) I thought you would enjoy that. I'm going to find something, though. Mm Mm-hmm. That isn't about, uh, about Dolly being jealous of... Esther Murphy and Natalie's bed and having to make way for Romaine. <laughs> so, for instance, we have my amusement, my gaiety, even my hostess instinct have all left me. I am in a trance and reality is only you and love. What a world I am heir to now. What miraculous rights I possess. What secret bread is mine. Wow. Intense. These are her letters to Natalie. She did inspire that in people. <laughs> Yes. So yes, her letters do survive, but I have found no published book just of them, just the snippets and biographies and other people's memoirs. Someone needs to do that, because it sounds like she put a lot of creative energy into those letters. Yes, I think if anyone were to call Dolly a writer, it would be entirely for her letters, where she's shown, where she showed like creative streaks. Mm -hmm. And then there is the book Natalie wrote about and dedicated to her, where she turned all of Dolly's friends into her biographers. Hmm. How so? She collected different reminiscences of Dolly from various people and put them together into a book called Ascara. Ascaria. That's really sweet. Do we have any, like, parts of it? That are good. So, for instance, Honey Harris wrote that what Dolly cast over her friends almost amounted to a spell. She would fly down in our midst like a beautiful, exuberant cuckoo, and in one moment I would find myself transformed from the rather shy and reserved person I was at the time into a jocular, garrulous chatterer, a very intoxicating change. Oh, that's wonderful. And that is the life and legacy of Dolly Watt. And remember, when your girlfriend's wife comes back into town, let her have the bedroom and go find a hotel. <laughs>